So it's my pleasure now to introduce our last speaker for the day, uh, Dr. Steve Horvath. Dr. Horvath is a professor of departments, human genetics and biostatistics at UCLA. Thank you. Steve. Um, um, thank you so much for um, giving me the opportunity. Um, the Paul Allen Frontiers funding has really had a huge impact on my own research. Um, today I will talk again about my favorite topic, epigenetic clocks. So <laughs> by now we realize um, that the DNA molecule is actually one gigantic clock. And I really like this artistic rendering of the DNA molecule. But um, as part of my um, um, project, I wanted to build a universal epigenetic clock that um, really measures aging and time in all mammals. And um, I'll start with the human data. So I generated these data really last week. Um, they, um, they involve many of my family members, my daughter and myself and my eternally young wife. But, <laughs> but also it involves um, many super centenarians. So I analyzed um, 30 different samples from people who reached the age 110 and more. And I was really thinking the one person who should have ended up as super centenarian was, of course, um, Paul Allen, you know. <laughs> but um, so the, the human epigenetic clock is remarkably accurate. It's the most um, accurate molecular marker of aging. But what makes it really surprising is that it applies to all tissues and cell types. And that's unusual because it is based on DNA methylation. And DNA methylation is really an epigenetic mechanism that allows cells to shut down certain genes and certain cell types. So um, in certain ways, DNA methylation should be the thing that differentiates different cell types. But paradoxically, in certain ways, you can use methylation um, to measure aging in all these different cells. Um, now, um, over the last few years, we've developed multiple epigenetic clocks. There's the original clock was a multi-tissue clock. Um, in recent articles, we've developed lifespan predictors. We're actually uh, quite capable of predicting lifespan. Um, we get extremely significant p-values. Whether these tools will be clinically useful, I'm not sure, but they are certainly very valuable in aging research. So they are already being used in clinical trials. So here I want to highlight one um, method which is called PhenoAge. PhenoAge should evoke something like um, a phenotypic age or organismal age. It was really based on clinical biomarkers initially, but then um, and um, clinical biomarkers that predict lifespan. But then in step number two, we um, found CPGs and uh, methylation profiles that would predict these clinical biomarkers. And um, here I show you um, lifespan prediction. Um, so if you, are, um, if you are 10 years older, according to this phenotypic clock, um, then you are on the green curve, whereas if you're 10 years younger on the phenotypic clock, you're on the blue curve. And this is, of course, a, a Kaplan-Meier plot that shows survival distribution in humans. So it shows you there's a fair amount of separation. Um, now, that's simply based on a blood test. Um, um, coming to the project, um, several groups have developed now epigenetic clocks in different animals. Our group developed clocks in dogs and in mice. Others have, um, but there are multiple uh, mouse clocks. Others have looked at um, clocks in humpback whales. So these are all feasibility studies that demonstrate you can build clocks in many mammals. But there are challenges. I, I would call it dirty little secrets. And that is, um, these published epigenetic clocks in these non-human species were developed based on a technology which is known as reduced representation bisulfide sequencing. And it has really been extremely difficult to compare these clocks across different RBS data sets. In certain ways, everybody has trouble validating it. And the reason is RBS may give you very high quality data for 200,000 locations in the genome in one data set, 
Now in the next data set, it will be another 200,000 locations, but these locations don't overlap. And that's really the kiss of death when it comes to biomarker studies. And so there's an obvious solution, develop a custom methylation array by focusing on um, specific locations. Another challenge in um, species studies is that for many species, we have only a poor quality genome assembly. And so, um, again, um, you can tackle that by developing a custom methylation array. And challenge number three is, let's say you have the data, how do you compare aging or, or methylation changes in one species to that in another species? Well, the solution is focus on CPGs in highly and ultra-conserved regions of the genome. And that's really the reason why we ended up focusing on mammals, because there you can um, find tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of highly conserved regions that can be profiled on an array. So when I first um, um, submitted the proposal, I aimed to analyze 30 different mammals. But then I said, for statistical reasons, we really want 50. But you know, the current status of the project is that we will already profile 58 different species. And I hope by the end, uh, um, maybe 80 or so. And um, we will analyze 51 pure dog breeds um, 17 bat species, multiple horse breeds, and all sorts of animals that I will describe. And as I mentioned, to do that, we um, had to build a custom mammalian methylation chip, which will profile 38,000 um, probes in, in, the, in mammals. And that chip really applies to any mammal. And um, we ordered 5,000 of these arrays um, uh, through the generous support. And all of these 5,000 arrays will be um, um, produced by February. So we will have a phenomenal data set. I want to briefly mention that um, how we designed the array. This was really done work um, by um, doctoral student Adriana Spurley and uh, Professor Jason Ernst at UCLA. So um, we developed an algorithm which we call the Conserved Methylation Array Probe Selector, and the name says it all. It selects, it selects certain probes in um, highly conserved regions for the purpose of methylation measurements. And um, now the probes that were selected are actually quite representative of the entire methylome. So um, the blue curve shows you um, the profile of a histogram of methylation based on hundreds of thousands of CPGs. And the red curve is, um, shows you the profile on the chip, and it's very similar. So we don't bias um, our array too much. So. so we have now entered step two, where we um, apply this methylation array to many different species. And um, I've really spent the last few months um, um, assembling a wonderful network of collaborators. I have over 30 different research groups, and they uh, provide various different animals. I try to sort them here by alphabetically. Um, you notice that I lack a Z for zebra, you know, but <laughs> um, so all sorts of animals um, from black bears, cats, cattle, dogs, elephants, uh, Tasmanian devil, sheep, of course, every, um, many other animals. Uh, last week, I did some serious research um, visiting SeaWorld because <laughs> they, um, uh, Todd Roback will um, contribute wonderful um, samples from marine mammals. Um, you may remember the bowhead whale can live over 200 years, so it's a very interesting animal to aging researchers. Um, I also visited um, the naked mole rat. That's a collaboration with Vera Gorbunova and other investigators. Uh, the naked mole rat is a rodent that can live 32 years, you know, and um, in certain ways the question is why, you know. And, and these um, naked mole rats live in the red-like district um, because they are African animals. They like heat, you know, so. <laughs> um, one thing um, I started was another very productive collaboration with Jerry Wilkinson from the University of Maryland, who will send me 17 different bat species. 
So it turns out there are over a thousand different bat species. And some bat species can live 41 years. Other bat species only live three years. Why? You know, what, are, what are the reasons for these differences in lifespan? Um, another question people always ask, why is it that some dog breeds live lo very long lives? So the oldest known beagle lived um, 27 years. There's a picture. But uh, Great Danes have an average lifespan of only eight and a half years. So I, um, in collaboration with Elaine Ostrander from NIH, we will analyze 51 dog breeds and um, over almost 600 samples from these dogs. Why? We want to see whether epigenetic changes can explain these differences. So overall, um, what I hope to address is to advance the molecular understanding of uh, cross-species differences in lifespan. And um, um, at the simplest level, we will have the best data set ever for testing the hypothesis that methylation um, um, patterns at conserved locations explain differences in maximum lifespans, maybe in dogs or in bats or across all mammals. Um, hypothesis two is, of course, to um, test whether the ticking rates of epigenetic clocks might explain differences in maximum lifespan. Maybe in the mouse, the methylation changes are f far la um, more uh, rapid. So here I show you a scatter plot of three different species. And uh, you see this kind of plot in the literature where people already make claims. But to test these hypotheses, you really need many species. Um, I want to show you some data from baboons. That's a collaboration with P Peter Nathaniels. Um, so we generated data now using this new methylation chip in brain samples and liver samples from baboons. And um, each dot is a CPG, and the X and Y axis measure aging effects. What do you see? Positive correlation. Now, that's the miracle of methylation, because you would ne not see that in transcriptional data. If you study age effects in the human brain versus age effects in human liver, there is no correlation. You know? But with methylation, you observe it. Um, but what is striking is you can ask the question, if I have human blood samples and I study aging effects, how do they relate to aging effects in the baboon brain? You know? And you again, you see pretty strong correlation. I mean, that's a correlation of 0.35. Um, that's surprising. And it's, um, it really um, is a wonderful confirmation that this project is actually feasible. You know? So there are certain CPGs in uh, human blood that get hypermethylated. They also get hypermethylated in the baboon brain and baboon liver. All of that is wonderful news. But now let's ask a very daring question. Do human epigenetic clocks predict age in baboons? And let's think about it. Well, it might be possible because humans and baboons are closely related. Genetic similarity, 94%. However, the human epigenetic clocks did not focus on conserved probes. They were just randomly, not randomly, but they were mathematically chosen in humans. Also, we are using here different array platforms. This is the new custom array versus the human epic array. Different probe chemistry. In certain ways, that should not work. You would never get this study funded in, in, at NIH because people know it cannot work. However, we applied the algorithm. No tweaking. These are the original human algorithms. And what you see here is this is the chronologic age of the baboon, and here's the estimated age in liver. And um, these are two different biomarkers. And what we see is very good correlations, correlations 0 0.67, 0 0.78. It's really um, amazing to me, at least. You know. So I think this um, all sh um, is a first example that this might pan out. However, the next step is, of course, to go to non um, to, uh, to um, other to rodents and uh, more distant um, species. I want to mention, let's say if you want to study aging in the baboon brain, 
there is a single CPG that already shows a correlation 0.85 with um, a, a chronologic age in baboons. And that's always my pitch to anybody who wants to listen. I mean, if, if you want biomarkers of aging, you have to focus on methylation. You know? Transcriptional data don't reveal these very strong correlations. So I want to stop by um, thanking my uh, UCLA team and, um, um, and of, above all, Paul Allen and the Paul Allen team. Thank you. We have time for a question over there. Yeah, Steve, the question I have is really about semantics. So when you look at some old people, they're mentally sharp, you know, all the, the nervous faculties are fine, but physically they're a wreck and vice versa. You can have old bones and old joints, but the rest of you is fine. So where do you differentiate between what's aging and what's disease? How do you handle that in the course of this research? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, let's, let me first say my personal um, opinion uh, or my philosophy is that aging is a disease because by um, making that statement I say we should treat it you know so <laughs> I'll start with that obviously though um, the FDA would strongly disagree you know they, uh, aging is not a disease you know um, in my opinion aging actually starts very early on you've seen um, today wonderful talks um, by um, Tom Ree and Dan Gashwin who showed that you can already detect these methylation patterns in, in the fetus you know so but then um, initially um, these changes actually serve a purpose um, so I, I, I've, I've I'm I have a theory which I call the epigenetic clock theory of aging, but it says that initially these changes are beneficial. They're important for um, development and tissue homeostasis. Only later on do they become um, um, antagonistic. Yeah. Yes. Claude? Uh. So I was just wondering, um, if you look at uh, tumors in patients of uh, different ages, or actually even how they evolve, does the epigenetic clock still keep ticking in those uh, tumors, or do they actually sort of uh, stop at the moment of uh, uh, transformation, or does it actually begin to reverse? I mean, I, I know they're genomically unstable, but yes. if it's a systemic effect, you might say it still ticks, but if not, uh, potentially, I, I just wonder if it actually reverses it. Yeah, um, well, multiple statements. The very short answer, yes and no, it means um, the basically the clock gets completely disrupted, you know. Having said that, it depends a bit on the tumor, you know. And, um, but also, as you indicated, we observe both um, directions. So, for example, in luminal breast cancers, the breast tissue is much older than expected. In triple negative breast cancers, it's much younger than expected, you know. So you can see everything. Tumor really disrupts things drastically.